Um, let me just start with prayer. Father, we thank you that we've had the privilege of knowing Tom Cunningham. Yes. And we thank you, God, that we got to walk with him as brothers in Christ and, and just share fellowship with him. And uh, he touched our lives. And we thank, that's what we're here for, to celebrate you sending him into the earth, sending him into our lives, sending him to touch us. And uh, uh, we just thank you, God, for all you've done through Tom. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, we do pray for this family, God, yes, as Lord. they're going through all that you have to do in these times. Yes, uh, to sort in and just pray grace, grace upon them, Father. The presence of the Holy Spirit comforting them and strengthening them. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'd like to just read uh, an obituary we wrote for Tom. Thomas Charles Cunningham was born April 24, 1938, in Omaha, Nebraska. Tom uh, graduated from the University of Oregon with a chemistry degree. Uh, he was quickly drafted into the Army. Um, this is his ROTC picture that we've blown up. Uh, 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 he entered as an officer. He served for 20 years uh, and retired as a major. While in the Army, Tom was stationed in a variety of locations all over the world. His sons have fond memories of learning to ski in the Alps, um, and Tom's passion for long hikes in the country in Germany, and there's actually a name for that, and I couldn't remember it. I probably couldn't spell it if I could. It's called... Hoaxmarch. Hoaxmarch. Hoax yeah. <laughs> Some German fancy name for hiking in the country. He uh, continued his career in a variety of jobs. His, uh, he was a lab chemist for the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, in his latter years, he uh, was ordained as a chaplain and served both in California and in South Carolina, assisting law enforcement agencies as a chaplain. Tom expressed an interest in moving to heritage communities from its onset. I've known Tom ever since we started this, However, he was committed to caring for his mother, uh, and uh, he was her primary caregiver for several years uh, before her passing. Tom also had compassion for the hurting or downtrodden, especially widows. He had a passion for mercy and deliverance ministries. In one of his son's words, if you needed prayer, you call on death. <laughs> Tom loved and served in all types of uh, helps ministries. He he um, he passed peacefully in Pineville, North Carolina, December 17, 2021. I uh, I asked Mike. I said, "Was there is there a particular scripture that you would like me to share?" And um, he said, "You know, my dad always had this poster on the wall." And uh, where they would move multiple times, and it was always this poster went with them, and it had John 15 on it. So that's what we're going to talk about: John 15 verses 1 through 7. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, He prunes it so that it can bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it ab abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I am him, he bears much fruit. We thank God for the fruit that Tom has borne, abiding in the Lord. He bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away and branches, um, as branches and dried up, and they're gathered them, they're cast into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. <coughs> And I'll just stop there. So here's Tom <coughs> with this poster, you know, uh, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. So this is this is deep in his psyche, in his soul. He 
He's abiding in Jesus. So he's, this is a life lived abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's why we loved him, is because we saw Christ in him, and we saw his every effort to abide in the Lord. So I want to read one more scripture, and this comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We know that if, that if the eternal tent, which is our house, this body, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with human hands, in, uh, hands eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with, uh, with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we have, having put it on, we, have, uh, we will not be naked, found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that whatever is mortal is swallowed up by life. Now, who, he who prepared for us this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Um, therefore, be always of good courage and know that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith but, and not by sight. So here's Paul. Tom is thinking, I want to abide in Christ. I want to abide in Christ. Here's Paul saying, <laughs> Gosh, while I'm in this flesh, I'm apart from the Lord. When I can, I, I look forward to that day when I, when I will be present with the Lord and absent from this body. Yeah. That's what Tom is experiencing yeah. right yeah. now. Amen. He is present with the Lord. I purposely had this photograph blown up because people who, to my knowledge, people who've had heavenly experiences and gone to heaven and had different kinds of experiences, they tell us there aren't any old people in heaven. Yeah. That doesn't mean that we can't get there because we're old. It just means that when we get there, we won't necessarily look old. And my, I want you to get familiar with Tom because I think that's what he's going to look like when we see him again. Okay, Even his children don't know this picture, right? This is before y'all. So um, um, what, do we, what do we lay aside when we lay aside this body? I don't know about you, but it was painful for me to watch the last few years of Tom just always yeah. struggling to just breathe. Yes. Tom can breathe now. Amen. Yes. Tom can remember stuff now. Right. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Amen. Tom can. Um, Tom has been set free from that lifelong struggle that we wrestle with in this flesh and body with sin, <laughs> temptation, and guilt. And Tom is free of all that. Yeah. He is celebrating good stuff. Here's one. Tom can read without glasses. <laughs> and there's one particular thing that I think he's particularly interested in reading. And that's there's a book in heaven, we are told, called the Lamb's Book of Life. And in there, if you look in there, are the names written of those who have committed their lives to Jesus Christ. Our name is written in the book of life, and Tom can see it with his own eyes. Jesus Christ wrote my name in his book. He's redeemed me. He has covered me. He has removed from me my sin. As far as the east is from the west, my sin has been thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. God doesn't remember anything of Tom's sin because his name is written in the book of life. Your name could be written in the book of life. Your sins could be as far removed from you as times are. All we do is invite Jesus to, um, to cover us with his sacrifice and his love. I imagine that Tom's remembering the day. He can remember stuff now. Yeah. And I imagine he's remembering the day he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'm thinking he was, he's probably thinking that might have been one of the best days of his life and the best decision he'd ever made. <coughs> well, Lord, thank you for Tom. Thank you for Jesus Christ who cleanses us from sin and makes heaven an option for us. No matter who we are, 
no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, heaven is an option for us. Eternal joy, eternal glory is an option for us because of Jesus Christ. And for that, we love it forever. We love it forever, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. All right. At this time, Jess Eckberg is going to come and lead us in a couple songs. Amazing.
here to honor an honorable man. Thank you for that. I thought I had all my tears cried out, but I may not. <laughs> so I ask your indulgence because Tom was like a big brother to me. I met him in 1978 as a young newlywed, never knew the Bible, and he was the very first Bible teacher I ever had. And we started with a really easy book, the Book of Revelations. <laughs> when I knew Tom, he was always the smartest man in the room. He had, he had worked hard, he was a man of the word, and I found him to be a man of his word. He was faithful. I know you guys know his humor. He always brought in a joke. I might have heard the same stories a few times, more than once, but they were funny and meaningful every time. His sons were very young at the time in Germany, and I saw him every weekend doing folks marches. That's what they were called. 
I've never heard of them either, but they were long walks, and what they did is they would scour the newspaper every weekend, and he and his sons would select a very small German village, and they would drive there finding, this is before GPS, right? Finding these little windy German villages was a part of the adventure. And he would take those boys on these 10K marches that they had marked out, and then they would win little medals. And he had a, a big map of, of, this is in Frankfurt, Germany, the central area of Germany. He had a big map on the dining room wall. They had little pins where he and, he and his sons had marched every weekend, almost every weekend that they could. He even did some long marches in, in the military where they wear packs and go from miles and miles for days and days. They don't run into something. I can't remember the name of it. But he, he was devoted to his sons and his wife. Um, Nikki was a nurse. They had already been to Germany before, and she was not fond of Germany. She was also a very shy person. So sometimes the Bible study would meet in the homes, and so I got to see in, in their homes. I got to meet Nikki, and I got to meet the boys and see their folks marching rhythms, and it really put it in my heart to do it. And when I became a mom of an Army officer and lived in Frankfurt, that one, I mean, later we read in Nuremberg, I did the same thing with my two little sons. I found every weekend the folks marching location and thought about Tom the whole time because when his family left Germany, what, in 79? I didn't see him again. I didn't think I'd ever see Tom again until I became a, a single mom in Charleston, South Carolina. And me and my boys were out rooting for and competing for Pat Robertson for president. Now some of you guys uh, remember that failed campaign. Some of us work really hard, you know, to bring a godly man into office, and lo and behold, at one of the rallies, there was Tom Cunningham, looking exactly the same as I remembered him. Now, this is ten years later, two babies later, he didn't know who I was in the world, and we reacquainted ourselves, and he became my big brother mentor in that season. He, he and Nikki were separated by then, and he knew I, I had just gotten my master's in ceramics art, and Gee, I was struggling to make a living, go figure. And so he was building this laboratory at the brand new Institute of Psychiatry downtown as part of the medical university. And it was an outpatient lab and they calibrated and did the um, results of the, the patient's lab results right there. He had hired the staff and they had to calibrate these machines every day. Highly technical, highly important work that he was doing there. And they had an outpatient phlebotomy clinic where they drew blood also. So he gives me a call one day knowing that I was in this single mom struggling to make it place. And I didn't know it at the time, it was a job interview. So he starts asking me questions, you know. Okay, so how are you in science? You know, what, 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 what's your background in science? I said, I think I had a psychology class in college once. <laughs> and then he says, okay, computers. Well, I, I did take a computer class in graduate school. How about typing? I know where the, the notes are. I mean, I know where the letters are. And um, how about how about um, um, any any kind of phlebotomy or anything? I said I think I know what the word means. <laughs> so Tom, being Tom, said I think we can work with that. <laughs> <laughs> so he hired me. In the next two years, I got to work very closely with Tom. And I tell you, we started every day in prayer. And I had some of the first visions I'd ever experienced in my walk with the Lord. Of, of, of how God was caring for these people and how seriously people can take. And he even said something to me, like, don't judge these doctors and nurses. Some of them were not living uh, anywhere near any kind, well, they were heathens, let's face it. But they were, they were working hard to help these people. And the Lord said, don't judge them. They're keeping my people alive until I can trust my church with them. So there was a deeper view. Tom was not about religion, he was about relationships. And it didn't take long to know that, that he took what he believed seriously and wanted to truly make a difference. He set up a program. He, they, the family had gone to a Presbyterian church in Somerville, I remember that, where he served. <coughs> and then he went to Seacoast, which is a very large church in Charleston. Some of you may know it. And he set up an inner healing ministry called Cleansing Streams. And he did that very successfully for quite a long time. And the church saw the success of it and actually hired somebody, not Tom, to lead that group. Uh, but then he ended up connecting with Morningstar. He loved America. He served in America finally as an officer and, and saw his older son, Mark, serve. And he married his beautiful wife, Carrie, and they had two wonderful sons.
sons. I got the privilege of being an art teacher to Tom's grandsons for a few years in my home studio. They're creative and intelligent. Not just good looking, but they're very, very special young men. Um, I've had the privilege to know them. <laughs> so Tom's kindness and his generosity, quiet, humorous background. So he went from this Vietnam vet, military officer, to a chemist for a major university, to Morningstar's janitor. <laughs> and he was the same person. Wow. He had the same quiet dignity and love for people and love for our Lord. He got his degree in, in um, chaplaincy, took that very seriously, and helped you know, to be able to help people in, in crises. He loved his two sisters very much um, and loved us. You know, he, lo he loved me and my family. I miss him. A friend of mine said this week, as I was grieving his loss, he's now in that great cloud of witnesses praying for us as he always did. He taught me to be not just a person of the word, but a person of the spirit and a person who wars for their loved ones. He was at my wedding 30 years ago and been part of my husband and my family. We had two more children, and Tom is like a great uncle to them. And they're in Germany, and my sons ended up back in Germany and married German women, and I have German grandchildren, and they're all here praying with us in the spirit today. So I know each of you has a story. Each of you has some way that Tom touched you, that he participated in your life, because he was a true man of God. He was true. He was the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Whether his station was high, whether his station was low, it didn't change who he was. So, I honor you, Mike, when you called me. He said, he still had my landline number in his cell phone from like 10 years ago, right? He's like, we couldn't reach you, but he finally found my number. That's awesome. Mark, it was, he came in and out serving and knowing what it was like to be a military man. lives on our floor. Tom lived on our floor, on the second floor, and um, Hilda can't be here today, but she asked me, she typed this out and asked me to share. So here it goes. Tom lived across the hall from me. On many occasions, when he would meet me in the hallway, Tom always greeted me with a big, beautiful smile and asked how I was. Lots of times he would say something funny and he would always leave me with the words of blessings. If he saw I, that I needed help, he would offer his assistance. He was one of the kindest people I've ever known. I saw Jesus in Tom. I will carry him in my heart forever. His son Mike is very much like his father, kind, smiling, and well-wishing. This is from uh, Hilda. And I just wanted to share for a second, too. Um, we've only been here about a little, almost five years. And I've known Tom. He would take good care of our floor with uh, making sure there was no trash or anything. You know, he was really, really, and he was always funny. He always had something, just something to throw out at you to, to make you smile. And um, he was just, he was wonderful, wonderful kind and sweet and good. He'd come to our door in the last couple of years and he would knock on our door and uh, say, is Fred here? I need him to help me with my phone or, or, my, or my, you know, the, my laptop or things like that or come to fix my TV or, you know, there was different things that, that he would uh, encounter Fred with. So, but he always greeted me well. He was always kind and 
I remember he, he had a special place that he would sit in church, and it was what we call the well. And the well is just a couple steps down from the main uh, sanctuary. And anyway, he would sit always in that chair right just below, right there, you know, like that. And so I go, Tom, that's your seat, huh? I see you all, you know, every Sunday, man, he'd be there. And he'd go, yep, I'm holding the fort down. <laughs> So he was just awesome. We just, I loved him because he was so kind and gentle. And, uh, he was just a blessing, and I'm sure I miss him. But we all carry something wonderful in our heart. I bless you. Bless you. Part of who Tom is, if you knew him. <laughs> he liked to wear hats too. You know? yeah. and, uh, uh, he's a tender warrior. That's what they If you knew Tom, he was a tender warrior. He loved God, he loved his country, his family. And I knew he loved me. So my wife and I came here, let's see, it was a little over seven years ago, and uh, part of Stay Praying and Engage. And Dave worked with us in the community to... Uh, <laughs> thanks. Okay. And my assignment was basically to help the, the uh, residents with whatever issues may come up, maybe mainly, uh, I guess you would say, handyman. <coughs> which wasn't my forte anyway. I was in sales and management, so I dealt with people and complaints most of the time. So anyway, my first assignment was to get a little note in the morning, and it had Tom Cunningham's name on it. So I went to his room, and uh, there were two things that he wanted to have done. One was to put the flag up. That was number one. And then the other one was curtains. So, <laughs> anyway, the flag went up, and uh, I knew where he stood as an American and a patriot and a man of God right away. And, you know, he made you feel comfortable right away. I mean, that was the way I felt with Tom. I mean, you talk about the peace of God and the, uh, the comforter that was in him made you feel that way. So, interestingly enough, um, not too long after Dawn and I were here, we uh, applied to become residents and got approved. So we were building our unit just above Tom. And uh, you think about symbolism, but we had a flag of the dove that went above the flag of the United States. Amen. And that's what's hovering there. It's chaos, but there is the Spirit of God that's hovering over it today. And just the symbolism of what Tom represented, even in his life and the things that he endured, the Holy Spirit kept him well, his soul was well. So that's what he represented to me. Not only to that, but you know what, what God has for this country. Not to be political, but uh, this, this is about both. Tom was on a rescue mission here. Uh, I'm sure he rescued many from this place in time of need and vice versa. For all the people that he encountered, likewise, he had that for us. There were, there were some funny moments with Tom, just like folks have known he had always a little joke to speak of and it just touched your heart but uh, we uh, Paul McCoviak had started a group here back maybe half a dozen years ago just to gather some of the men in the community to have some fellowship uh, develop friendship and pray for the community and uh, the purpose for that was really to uh, bring us together, 
pray for America, pray for Israel, and pray for Morningstar. So I, I, the way the Lord works with me is he gives me puns or acronyms. So we were the Amen. <laughs> America, Israel, Morningstar. So those are the focuses that we had. The other thing is with our group, uh, it seemed like as time went on during the meetings, uh, one or more would fall asleep. Uh, so naps would occur. And uh, which occurred quite often, quite frankly. I might have been caught nodding myself. At any rate, um, one of the teams that Tom and I had served on together was the hospitality team. Uh, when Kramer here invited me to join the group and after a thorough examination of my past, I was approved. <laughs> and you know how it is. Sometimes your dog gets approved to come to the community before you do. Dave knows all about that. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I made the cut. Anyway, there was a time when we needed more uh, overseers, so I recommended Tom to the team, which I knew he'd make be a great contribution to it. So knowing Tom as a team player and just the right personality, our job was really to keep the, the right atmosphere around the uh, leadership tables for them, for the leadership team and the guests. And Tom did a great job with that. With his just perfect demeanor. However, I would catch him at a few times taking naps, and uh, that would be my job to watch Tom. <laughs> at any rate, I think there's something in that, you know. And I was thinking about the acronym today, NAPS, uh, and it might be appropriate for today because. We know that old men are supposed to dream dreams. God didn't tell you when. You know, just do it. <laughs> so my new acronym for NAPS, as Tom did so well, and some of us else did as well, is the New Apostolic People. And that will include, include prophets, preachers, pastors, and patriots. Amen. So that's what's coming. I know there's a dream in heaven that it comes to earth, and Tom is part of that. Uh, I drove in here. I always wonder, because Dave had mentioned, I think, in passing, have you ever rode with Tom? <laughs> I said, no, not yet. Why? And he never gave me an answer. But I wonder about that. Anyway, I found out. But as I, as I pulled in this afternoon to come to the service, I pulled in next to his car. The vibration, the vibe. Yeah, he had a vibe about him, right? We knew that. I know we were talking to the men's group the other day about vibrations, the spirit of God, and what resonates in us. And so the frequencies of God. And Tom has that. He had that. And he does now. He's got full vibration. Yes. Just put on the brakes, Tom. <laughs> oh, you lost the paper. Right you lost the paper. I just felt I wanted to share a few words, and uh, because Tom was on our floor, we live across uh, from Fred and Mary, that is, uh, anyway, those who know where we live know what I mean by that. <laughs> so anyway, Tom I would see quite often in the hall, and um, I really appreciated getting to know him. And those who've lived here two and a half or three years and back will remember when he faithfully gathered up the trash, yeah. and uh, I admired his faithfulness, and, and then after a while, he was no longer doing it, so, 
But um, as I was listening to all the messages, and, and thank you, Karen, who I've never met you before, I really appreciated what you shared about him. But I, I, one couple of verses that came to me that I think have, are fulfilled in Tom's life. Uh, very well-known verses, uh, Hebrews 12. verses 1 and 2, and I'm going to just quote this from the King James because that's how I memorized it. Amen. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, and Karen, I think, said that he's in the cloud of witnesses. Amen. Wherefore, see, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And Tom has now laid aside all weights, as David brought out so well. Let us lay us out every way, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And Tom has run that race, and he's crossed the finish line. Yeah. Amen. Looking unto Jesus, and as I was thinking about this, and this is I was to share, and it seemed like it was appropriate. You know, and now we look at Jesus, sometimes it seems like he's, he's a long way away, you know, while we're in this body, in this life. But now, Tom is right there with him. So now he can see him up close, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the, of the throne of God. So that's the scripture I had for, for Tom, and I, I hope it means something to his, his children and to the rest of us. God bless you. <laughs> My job's easy. When I think of Tom, I think of the words duty and country and patriot. Yes. Tom was a patriot. I got to know Tom going to the Club 55 restaurant over here, the hamburger place. He loved those malts. Malts there, we gotta have malts. So we went to have malts. I was his first mentor. What do you call it, brother? What do you call it, the uh, friend? What do we call it? His buddy. I took, I took him along. I taught him some things about heritage, and uh, I hope I taught him some good things. But the thing is, I considered him an intellectual giant that was used everywhere he went. And he was a he was a Vietnam veteran. He went to Vietnam. As a chemistry, you know, he taught, you know what he did? He tested drug for, well, one of his duties was to test, have people tested for drugs over there. Yeah. But there he was. His intellectualism was used there. And then he came back to Walter Reed in the, in, the, in the operating room. Intellectualism, service to the people, right there in Walter Reed. And I always look at him and say, man, Tom, you're, you're, a, le you're, a, you're a legend among yourself, but he, he says, not really there, I just serve my country. Wow. ROTC right there, military was easy for him. But you know, he served 20 years. Why? Because he was an ROT, ROTC officer. That was it, 20 years. He'd have probably gone further. The main thing was, I don't know exactly when he accepted the Lord, but I'm sure that he carried the Lord with him. It was not just intellectualism and duty, it was caring for others because of God's word. Amen. God's word. I consider him a legend because this country needs people more like him right now more than ever. Amen. They care about the country, care about the Lord, care about morals, and care about the Holy Spirit Amen. and the future of this great nation. Amen. We went to coffee together. And I think we went to uh, we celebrated a few Veterans Day celebrations over at, uh, in, in uh, North Carolina. And the thing is, there's a lot of talk about politics, politics, politics. I think William Wiseman was long as one point time. But the thing is, Tom always had hope in America. Even in what's going on right now, he had hope. And we need hope. We need guys like Tom. Yeah. And when he came here 
and he had to go to work. Hey, he had to work. He was 75 years old working. How do you think he felt at the end of the day? He was tired. But Tom carried on to the end because he learned about duty and patriotism and to follow through. And that's what we need as Americans. He also was a good socialite. Jimmy Fairchild and Lella and myself and Tom would get together at conferences. Before Ella and, Tom, before Ella and Jimmy moved in here, it was always a great thing to come up here and talk about the Lord and talk about him and meet each other in fellowship before you got up here and Tom was just a great person to talk to. He could talk about anything. One other thing about Tom, about Tom. Did you ever go to his room? Not too many books in there. <laughs> now listen, he, I hope you read all those books. But the main book that, that meant something to him was the Bible and his teachings and who he was. And I got to meet Tom a little, I mean, got to talk to Mike a little bit. I was honored to get to be able to go through a little bit of his military career here at, uh, after he died, just to make sure things were in order. And let me tell you something. The man had all kinds of awards in the military. He never said a word about his awards. Not to me. But he was a patriot, and he served well. And he's an example. And I, everybody said everything. I, I, I know you want to go, but God bless this man. He's at rest now. One thing about heritage. He came here. How many years was he here? Seven, eight years? Okay, he came all the way to the end. That's the thing about heritage. Hey, some of us are gonna come here, some of us are gonna die right here just like Tom, just like Makoviak, just like the rest of them. You're taking care of us, thank you so much. Thank you for the friendship, thank you for the fellowship, and thank you for allowing us to become closer to God with what goes on here at Morning Star and Heritage, David. And uh, I'll close right now and I'll just say one thing, we need more Toms in this world today. God bless your dad. sitting there a while ago, well, I don't remember who was up talking, but they mentioned about the cloud of witnesses. And I don't know why, but I looked up to that corner right there. I just feel like there's a cloud of witnesses standing all around here right now. And I, for some reason, my eyes went right to that little corner. It's, it's almost like Tom standing there. I don't know. It could be. But I felt, you know, it was just a, an odd feeling that he was standing there. But for those who, who know me, I, I'm the one who to, to help, and, and Tom was that way too, and I really enjoyed being around him and to talk to him, and to find out some of the stuff I'm finding out today, he, he would bring his phone to me, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to explain that, but his intellect is so far, far above mine, he's asking me to help him with something, to me at that point, it was so simple, but you know, it's just the way life is sometimes. Thank you. Uh -huh. Tell you one of the fondest memories that I'll always remember of your dad is um, he wanted to be here yes, yes. years before he moved here, and, uh, and he he put his personal agenda aside so that he could help his mother. Who does that? You know, that's pretty cool. Um, and so he he was he was a self-sacrificing individual. A 
giver. And may we be like that. Father, again, we just thank you so much that we've been touched by Tom Cunningham. We thank you for his life. We thank you for all the people he touched. Karen's just one example of dozens and dozens of people that got touched by his, his preaching, his teaching, his devotion to you. Christ wasn't just all about him and Jesus. It was He was a sharer. He was a giver. And he shared his life. And we got touched by it. We thank you for that, Lord. And we do pray for this family, God. Bless them and give them strength. In Jesus' name.